Good morning and welcome to our worship for Cary Baptist Church for Sunday the 11th of April. As most of you watching this will know, we are now meeting in the church again. Uh, last week we had, I think, nearly 38 people, I think, uh, there, which was, which was great. Uh, about as many as we can fit in downstairs, keeping socially distanced. But of course, we've got the gallery as well. So other people are welcome to join us as well. And the plan, as again, many of you will know, was that we would live stream our services from the church. Uh, that's still the plan. Uh, but what we discovered is simply that the Internet connection in the church at the moment is just not fast enough for us to do that well. Um, the video was just like really, really broken. Um, so we'll be upgrading the speed. Hopefully that'll be pretty quick, um, but obviously it depends on when the uh, the service provider can actually do it. So uh, soon we believe we'll be able to live stream and you'll those joining us on YouTube and those in church will be uh, at least a bit more connected. But for at least the next couple of weeks, uh, we're going to be doing it like this again. Uh, the services, however, will be short, reflecting the fact that in the, in the church, um, because of COVID restrictions, we can't sing. We're keeping the services pretty short. So this service will be... This online service will be pretty short as well. There'll be fewer songs and the message will be a bit shorter, the prayers will be a bit shorter uh, and so on. Okay, so with that said, let's let's pray. Father, we commit this time to you uh, now. We thank you that, that some of us are able to gather again together in the church, Lord, and we, we pray that you would uh, you bless that meeting. We pray as well that you'd bless those who are joining this service online, Lord God. That wherever we're, we're listening to this, wherever we are, are joining together in worship, Lord, we would encounter uh, the living God. We would be changed and challenged. We'd be uh, in, made increasingly into the likeness of Jesus and, and into the people that you really want us to be. Empowered by your spirit to live and work for you in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our children's talk today. Now, those of you who came to Mini Messy Church know exactly what I'm about to say, but we are going to start looking at people who pray in the Bible because prayer is such a big, important part of our lives. I thought it was best that we looked at some of the people who set a really good example for us to follow. And we are going to start with a man from the Old Testament named Samuel. So we're going to learn a bit about Samuel before we look at how he prayed. Samuel was chosen by God to do some amazing things and he lived God's way his entire life. From his miracle birth right the way through to the day he died, Samuel was listening and Samuel was acting on what he heard. Now, Hannah, his mum, couldn't have children and we see that a lot in the Old Testament, don't we? And as we see in some of the other stories like Sarah, she prayed really hard to God and Samuel appeared in her belly. And when Samuel was in Hannah's belly, she promised God that Samuel's life was his. That Samuel would live a life that God wanted him to. And Hannah kept her promise when Samuel was between three and six. We don't actually know how old he is, but I bet you know people who are aged three, four, five or six. And you know how little they still are. Hannah took Samuel to the temple to live with a guy named Eli who was going to teach him the ways of the temple. Eli was a priest and Samuel was there to be his helper and it is Eli who helps Samuel first understand that it is God trying to talk to him. Those who came to Mini Messy Church, bear with me, everyone else. Samuel was asleep in his bed. And he heard a voice call him, Samuel, Samuel. And as we all would when we hear an adult voice, we run to the nearest adult. And Samuel went to Eli and was like, Eli, you shouted me. Um, and Eli took three times to realise that the person shouting Samuel was God. And from that day, Samuel was listening. Samuel did as God wanted him to do. Samuel went where God wanted him to go. The verse I'm going to read you just about sums up how much Samuel really listened and prayed to God. So I'm going to read you 1 Samuel 12, 23 to 24 and it says, bear with me because it's down here so I'll have to look down. I will not stop praying for you. If I did, I would be sinning against the Lord. I will teach you what is good and right, but you must honour the Lord. You must always serve him with all of your heart. Remember the wonderful things he did for you. Samuel said he would not stop praying, that he would do it always. Now, always and not stopping something is a very long time. So I want you to stand up off your chair and I want you to start doing some star jumps. So you can do star jumps, you can run on the spot. If you're slightly older and you're, you can't do that, maybe you could sit down and do some punching with your arms. I want you to get your bodies moving and I want you to keep your body moving as long as you can whilst I do this talky bit. When you are too tired and you need to stop, stop that's okay. But I think it's going to be pretty tricky to do star jumps the entire time I am talking to you. Because always is a very long time. Not stopping something means you are doing it forever. And forever is a very, very long time. But Samuel prays always. He never stops praying. Because he knows that talking to God is where he's going to find out the important things. It's where he learns everything. And praying is just as important in our lives today as it was for Samuel. Because prayer is one of these gifts that God has given us. It's our way of talking to him. It's our way of of listening to the amazing things that he wants to do 
in our lives just as the amazing things that he did in Samuel's just because he was listening. And our prayers don't have to be big and fancy. They don't have to have big words in them. They just have to be your conversation with God. God knows how you talk. God understands how you talk and the words you know and the words you don't and the things you say that make you, you. If anybody's ever noticed, I say so a lot. Um, I've only noticed this since I've started filming things and I have to listen to myself back. I start a lot of sentences by going, so. But God knows that, that's what makes me, me. And he wants to hear you talk to him in the, just in the way that you talk to your friends, to your parents, to me, to James, to your grandparents. All he wants to hear is that you love him and you trust him and that you know you don't always do things right, but that you know that he will forgive you. He wants to know that you believe in his son dying on that cross. And actually, however you say that, whatever you say, whatever words you use are amazing because he knows they're coming from your heart. But I will admit it can be tricky to pray. It can, can't it? We, it's quite hard to sit there and come up with words straight away and you can be sat in the choir and it's a bit awkward and when you're in church you're twiddling your thumbs a little bit because because you need a wee or you know what's for dinner or you know that you're getting the bus back which means you get to go to B&M and get some sweets but actually there is a really useful prayer we can use that give that was given to us by Jesus and gives us all the important things that we need to say and that prayer is the Lord's prayer. It says everything. It covers all of the things we might want to say to God. And we don't have to use the big complicated words that are in it. It's, it doesn't have to be tricky. But I thought we could have a look at the words of the Lord's prayer now to finish together and put it into words that we might understand a bit easier. So I have the words of the Good News Bible version here in front of me. That's the Bible we use in church, the blue ones that are normally on the shelves that aren't there now because of COVID. But this is the words that it uses. I'm going to read you a line and if it has a big tricky word in it, I'm going to give you another word that you could use instead that will make it easier to understand. So, you might want to close your eyes, you might want to put your hands together, you might want to watch me, you might want to hold your hands out in front of you. Because as I say this, you can be praying along with me. So the first line is, our Father in heaven. I think that makes sense, don't you? Or if you wanted to change the word father, you could change it to dad if you wanted to. You could change it to whatever you call your dad, papa, pops, whatever you use, you could change it. So our father in heaven, may your holy name be honoured. The big fancy version of that is hallowed be your name. But God's name is holy, isn't it? God's name is pure. God's name is amazing and that is why we call it holy may your kingdom come so we all know that jesus will come again one day and he will bring heaven down to earth and we are all waiting for that day we all believe that day will happen and that is why we say it in the prayer may your kingdom come to us May your will be done on earth as in heaven. Well, in heaven, everything God wants to happen is happening. People are loving their neighbours. People are being kind. People are being patient and using amazing words. And we want that to happen here on earth with us now, don't we? That's what we're trying to do with our lives. We are trying to live God on earth. Give us today the food we need. God always looks after us. If we trust in God, we will get everything we need. Forgive us 
the wrongs we have done. That word is sometimes, a, that word in other versions of the prayer is sin or trespasses. Do, we do things wrong. We are human. That is what about what you be there? What being human is about. And we need to say sorry for that. Because when we say sorry, God welcomes us back and makes our lives sparkly and new and amazing again. Because we've trusted him to do that and we have come to him and said sorry because we know we have done wrongs. The next line, I'll put them back together because they fit together. But forgive us the wrongs we have done as we forgive the wrongs other people may have done God asks us to ask for forgiveness when we do things wrong but he also asks us to forgive the people who do nasty things to us who make us feel sad who do things that hurt us because when we forgive them we are showing them that we love them and that God loves them too bring us to hard testing but keep us safe from the evil one God, we know you're going to give us challenges, that's okay, but keep us safe from the evil one. Keep us safe from the things that will tear us away from you. That's what that's trying to say. We like challenges. Challenges make, make our faith stronger, make us love God more when things are a bit tricky and we have to trust in him. But keep us away from the things that will really hurt us, that will really make us sad and really make us lose trust in God. The kingdom, the power and the glory are yours. Heaven and earth, all of the power in the world because God has all of the power. His power is so amazing that one of the verses in Genesis says that he spoke the stars into existence. Well, we now know there are billions of stars and in one breath they all appeared. God is powerful. So heaven and earth, all of the power and the glory is God's now and forever. And then we'll do the messy church, amen. Come on. You're probably all still out of breath from doing your star jumps or your, or your boxing or you're running on the spot. Whatever you were doing to see how long you could do it for, I bet you're out of breath. So let's do a messy church, amen, together. So crouch down, wiggle up and jump. Are we ready? Amen.
Our reading this morning is Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things, and then enter his glory? And, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on, as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened to them on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. Amen. Cleopas and his friend had been followers of Jesus. They had recognised him as a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. They had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. All their hopes and their expectations for the future were bound up in Jesus. 
And now that those hopes had been dashed, Jesus was dead. The chief priests and the rulers had conspired against him and handed him over to die on a Roman cross. We meet them walking down the road to the village of Emmaus. We don't know why they were going there. We're not told. They may have lived there. Or they may have just have been using it as a stop on a longer journey back to their homes elsewhere. Or perhaps they just wanted to get as far away from Jerusalem and the terrible events that had just happened. Emmaus wasn't far. Seven miles, an afternoon's walk, but far enough to, to get away, to think, to try and put things in perspective, to begin to rebuild their broken lives. Anyway, as they walked along, talking to one another and trying to make sense of it all, a stranger approached. Now, probably this was the last thing they wanted. Probably they would have preferred to keep to themselves. They were in mourning. They were devastated. I doubt very much that they wanted to talk to this stranger. Besides, for all they knew, he might have been one who had approved Jesus' death, one who called out, crucify him. They wouldn't have wanted to talk to someone like that. But whether they wanted to talk or not, the stranger didn't give them any choice. He caught up with them and he began to walk alongside them. Tell me, he said, what are you discuss discussing as you walk along? What a question! How could he even ask that question? Surely there was only one thing on everyone's mind. It's almost as though someone had come across two New Yorkers two days after 9-11 and seeing they looked miserable had asked them, hey, what's the problem? Surely everyone knew what had happened. This man must be either an idiot or a stranger to Jerusalem or he would have known all about Jesus who had been crucified. It's interesting to look at what Cleopas and his friend told this stranger, because it's as though they're almost trying to piece together a mystery but can't quite see how it all fits together. They know that Jesus was a prophet, powerful in word and deed. They had hoped that he would prove to be the Redeemer of Israel. They knew that that very morning the tomb of Jesus had been discovered empty. They knew that angels had appeared to the women and told them that Jesus was alive. They were followers of Jesus, so they must have heard surely on several occasions that he had predicted his death and that he would rise again on the third day. And they must have been faithful Jews because they had gone up to Jerusalem for the Passover. So they must have been familiar with the Old Testament and its prophecies of the Messiah and of all that would happen to him. The evidence was all there, but without someone to help them, they were unable to piece it all together. The mysterious stranger was pretty blunt with them. How foolish you are, he said, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what, what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. They still didn't know that this was none other than the risen Lord, Jesus himself back from the grave. Later they would see him for who he was, but on the road he was still a stranger to them. And this is a powerful symbol of the way God often works in our lives. When we are at our lowest ebb, God comes alongside us and ministers to us. And we feel the situation change and our hope rising, but we fail to observe that God is walking along the path with us. Perhaps God simply comes to us and lifts us by his spirit. Perhaps he does it through another person through something we see or read or a change in the circumstances. And it's only later that we look up and say, yes, that was the Lord. Jesus has promised to be with us always. It may not always seem that way, but in the times of doubt or darkness or distress, Jesus is with us. He may come as a stranger, unrecognized at the time. At the time. He may come as the strength that bears us up and carries us through when times are tough, but he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. This is really what the, uh, the famous Footprints poem is all about. Jesus comes to us and perhaps at the time we don't recognise it, but he bears us up and he brings us through. Still, back on the Emmaus Road, to clear past and his friend, Jesus was still a stranger, albeit one who was proving more interesting by the minute. As they were approaching the village, Jesus acted as if he was going on further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. For it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. Perhaps they were just being hospitable. 
But I think more than that, they were fascinated by him and by what he had to say, and they wanted to hear more. So they were eager that he come in and spend the night with them. So Jesus came in and he sat at the table with them. And when he was at the table, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Then, although it was really late, they got up and they rushed back to Jerusalem to tell the others that they had seen the Lord. And when they got there, they discovered that Peter had also seen the Lord that day. And if we read on into verse 36, we would see that uh, at, at that time, Jesus appeared to them all together as well. So Cleopas and his friend, they had time to race back from Emmaus, so Jesus had time to get back too. But the risen Jesus had no need to put on his running shoes to get back to Jerusalem. There was something different about him. He could still be touched. He could eat and walk and talk. He still had a real physical body, but post-Easter, it's a body which is not limited by the usual constraints of matter. Space and time are open to the risen Lord. He can disappear in an instant and appear again in the midst of a crowded room whilst all the doors are locked. And he can walk for a whole afternoon alongside two people who must have known him quite well without being recognised until he broke bread. Jesus' resurrection body was transformed. It was sort of a real physical body, but it was transformed. The Gospel witnesses are clear about that. Jesus, who was crucified, was made physically alive again. And if he was different after dying and rising, That is hardly surprising. In fact, it's a great encouragement to us believers uh, because we know that we will be raised to be like him too. His resurrection body is a prototype of the kind of bodies with which we who belong to the Lord will all rise. So finally, let me draw attention to the ways in which Jesus revealed himself to Cleopas and his friend. When Jesus spoke to them and opened the scriptures to them, their hearts burned within them. As Jesus spoke the word of God to them, revelation dawned in their hearts. The confusion and the fear and the heartbreak fell away, and they were able able to grasp God's truth. Later, when they sat down at the table, Jesus took the bread and, and he gave thanks, just as he'd done just over three days earlier at the Last Supper. And then not only did their hearts burn, but their eyes were opened. They realized that this was Jesus, their saviour. And they surely, given all that Jesus had told them, grasped the significance of the bread as Jesus' broken body and the wine as his blood shed for them and for us. See, God can speak with us and meet with us in in all kinds of ways. Uh, The great Swiss theologian Karl Barth says, you know, God can speak in a Mozart flute concerto, Russian communism and a dead dog. But there are some places where he has promised to meet with us. He has promised to meet with us when we read his word when we gather together as as his people, and when we break bread together. Sadly, if you're listening to this online, I guess you're you're not able to gather together yet. You're able to read the word, but at least virtually we're able to be in touch with with each other. And of course, none of us are, are breaking bread and sharing communion just yet. But these are the places that God has promised to meet with us, and we can continue to meet with them by reading his word, by sharing fellowship together, either virtually or by calling one another within the fellowship, keeping in touch with each other, as we look forward to the day, hopefully not far along, far away now, when we will be able to break bread together um, in, in the church and celebrate all that Jesus has done for us in just the ways that we'd want to do that. We come now to our time of prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you again for your goodness, your grace and your mercy to us. We thank you that you are a great and mighty God and that whatever concerns we may face, there's nothing which we could bring to you which is too great for you or beyond your power. And because you you are all knowing, Lord, and all loving, there is nothing which is too small uh, for you to be concerned about. If it concerns us, then we can bring it to you and you will be concerned for us and be able to, to intervene for us too. So, Lord, we lift up to you, first of all, the the ongoing situation with COVID in our country and around the world. We thank you, Lord, that things are going much better in this country, but we we acknowledge that there are still tens of people dying every day from COVID. 
uh, and although that seems a, is a great improvement, it's still a tragedy for all of those people. So we pray, Lord God, that the situation would continue uh, to improve, that the vaccine rollout would continue to be successful, that uh, where changes may need to be made to the programme um, for younger people, perhaps that those changes will be made in the right way. We pray as well, Lord, that the vaccines would become increasingly available to those in developing countries, poorer countries of the world, and that the rich countries would not simply hoard more and more vaccines for themselves, Lord, but would simply take what they need and then immediately pass on what they don't need uh, to other countries to help them get through this and to save lives there too. And we do pray, Lord, as we think of those, those daily deaths for those who mourn in this country. We pray, of course, for uh, the royal family at this time as they mourn uh, the loss of Prince Philip, but also for all those who are mourning because they've lost people uh, to COVID and indeed to other things too, that you would draw near to them, that you would bless them and help them and strengthen them. We pray for, for people in our own fellowship, Lord, we think particularly of Richard and Fiona at this time. We pray that you draw near to them, bless them and strengthen them. Uh, just, just let them know your, your presence in an incredibly strong way. Uh, in the days and weeks ahead. We pray, Lord God, that you would be with those who are suffering from various health problems, maybe to do with dementia or, or old age or other issues as well. You draw near to each one, Lord God. You'd give each one the help and the support, the encouragement that they need. We pray for our young people as we, as we plan uh, to resume face-to-face uh, -face, uh, youth work from uh, the 20th of May. We pray that that would go well. We pray that you continue to bless our young people as they work through this really difficult time too. We pray, Lord, for all those in our country, in our fellowship and further afield, who have lost jobs or lost livelihoods uh, because of COVID. We pray, Lord, that uh, economies would recover quickly, that people would be able to get their jobs or, or new jobs uh, to take the place of the jobs that they've lost. We pray, Lord God, that people would not uh, continue to suffer financially because of this and that governments here and around the world would make wise choices as the, to the best way to rebuild the economy and to do it in a way which is, is better and fairer and uh, more environmentally friendly so that it's, the world is made better for everyone going forward as a result of this. And as we think of the wider world, Lord, we think as well, of course, of our, our, our link missionary, uh, Claire, now back in the Guinea Bore 2 hospital in Chad, working for the BMS. We pray that you'd bless her and the work going on there. We pray that you'd bless the work of the BMS all around the world. We thank you for their uh, work uh, promoting the, the petition, along with other organisations, to uh, encourage governments to uh, roll out COVID vaccines to the poorer countries of the world pray that, that would be effective. Thank you for their work, um, well, in, in so many ways, Lord God, around the world, uh, reaching out, uh, planting churches, evangelizing, involved in medical mission, agricultural mission, involved in uh, combating climate change. We pray that you bless all of these works. Similarly, for Tear Fund, Lord, we thank you for their, their work. We thank you for all the good that they do. We pray that you would bless them in their work. We ask all this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.
Wilson.